Today we start looking at uh, type A errors, that is random errors in chemical analysis. Now, a disclaimer. This is not your mathematical statistic class. I am not doing any mathematics with you. I am just trying to show how we use mathematical formulas in analytical chemistry. Please read appropriate chapters in your book for more details. This lecture and these lecture slides are not to start with. It was observed that when you do plenty of measurements with random errors, so they have random nature, you often will have a bell-shaped curve. This distribution of data is often named normal distribution, well, there is nothing normal, or Gaussian distribution, coming from the name of Karl Gauss, German mathematician of late 18th century. So this mathematic is more than 200 years old. By the way, Karl Gauss developed this math when he was 18 and was working as land surveyor. So many of you are already too old for such discoveries. Try to do as much as you can do now. Mathematically, Gaussian curve can be written in such a fashion. Y is constant, 1 divided by some number sigma and square root of 2 pi, you know what stands for pi. And here we have exponential function. X so parameter on this axis, minus number mu squared and divided by 2 sigma squared, the same sigma is here, and minus sitting before. Now we can slightly simplify this expression simply saying that y is proportional to exponent, keeping in mind this value in yellow is constant. And then we have two parameters, mu, that we always say it's mean, and sigma, standard deviation. Now, when you take square of any number, you always have positive numbers, so this and this are always positive. Now, we put negative sign before this expression, so this expression is always negative. If x is equal to mu, you'll have zero, an exponent of 0 will be 1. You'll have a maximum reading of this number. So it's just constant. Now, if x is larger or smaller than mu, you'll have smaller readings of y. And this curve will be symmetrical because it does not matter is it positive or negative deviation. 68% of our measurements will be between minus sigma and plus sigma. 95% will be between minus 2 sigma 
and plus to sigma. And 99.7 will be between minus 3 and plus 3. Gaussian distribution is not the only distribution that is around. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of other distribution, uniform distribution. There is zero probability that our number is less than A. Exactly the same probability between A and B and zero probability after that. Example of such distribution is I'm just saying that something happened yesterday, not elaborating about the time. So this will be the beginning of day yesterday, this will be the end of that day. But you have no information when it's in between. You can have plenty of such examples. Triangular probability distribution. Somehow similar to bell shape, but you have zero probability below A and zero probability above B and very simple distribution here. Uh, there is opinion that uh, uh, this is distribution of errors of our Pareto distribution is very famous in uh, economics and human activity. Uh, there is interesting example of Cauchy Lorentz distribution. This is example of pathological distribution. You cannot use average or mean as its expected value. You cannot use standard deviation as well because mathematically these two numbers will not be stable. Nevertheless, it's bell shape and it's quite real. For example, NMR spectra peaks have this Lorentz shape. Now, coming back to our Gaussian curve, uh, there is more or less common opinion that experimental errors distribute as Gaussian. So, our Gaussian function is determined by two parameters, mu, which is real number of mean, and sigma, that is equivalence of standard deviation. Now, I'll use Greek letters for me if I really know it. I'll use Greek sigma for standard deviation if it's real number. So, if we know mu and sigma, you know all about this distribution. So, when you do measurements, your goal is to receive as good estimate of mu and as good estimate of sigma as you can. So, let's look at examples of how we can find mu and sigma. Case number one, we know real number mu and standard deviation sigma. Okay, there's nothing left. We actually know everything about this random number. Example, concentration of chromium in steel is 21.23 plus minus 0.07%. How it can be done? This material was analyzed by numerous laboratories, so we have hundreds of measurements to support these numbers, and we know it quite precisely. Sometimes we can estimate standard deviation theoretically. 
So no measurements necessary. Uh, we already have a solution. Case number two. We know real value mu, but we do not know standard deviation. That means we need to do measurements to find sigma. What we do, we take several measurements, n measurements, and calculate standard deviation as measurement 1 minus mu, known real value, measurement 2 minus mu, known real value, and so on for all n measurements, square them, divide by number of measurements we made, and take square roots of it. Keep in mind that we are not estimating mu, we already knew it. Example, I need to use a new method. I know the real value of concentration, but I want to check my method performance. It's important I like that we are using n in this formula. We'll see it's not always the case. Now, what if I know standard deviation sigma, but I do not know the real value of my estimate of mu? I need to again take measurements. So I'm taking n measurements and calculate average as my estimate. So average will be simply first measurement, second measurement, all the way to n divided by number of measurements. With increase of the number of measurements, we expect that average will be close to real value mu. Example of such case. I am using the same procedure for a long time. It always gives me the same standard deviation. So I do not need to recalculate it. Now I have my readings for average. 1.37%. So the result will be 137 plus minus standard deviation of 0, 0, 003. This 0, 0, 003 is better estimate for standard deviation than I can receive from this particular measurement. I'm just using it. And now, case number four, the most general case. I do not know mean and I do not know standard deviation. What should I do? Again, I need to take measurements and I calculate average as usual, adding all my measurements and dividing total by number of measurements. Next, I calculate standard deviation, taking my estimate of measurement and subtracting it from first measurement, then second measurement, minus mean, and so on, until the very last. Square all these and divide by n minus 1. Keep in mind, not n like we did before, but n minus 1. So this is not sigma. This is our estimate of sigma. Now, of course, it can contain some error. So, not n, but n minus 1 in this case. So, if I know the result, I am calculating standard deviation using known value of result and divide by n number of measurements. If I measure the value myself, very similar formula, but instead of known value, I put my average and divide by n minus 1. 
n minus 1 of course is smaller than n and this number is larger than this number I know less uncertainty is larger 